This is the 12th and final video in a big series about mapping out and practicing melodic arpeggio guitar shapes on the guitar, mapping out chord tones of individual chords and all the places where we can play those chord tone shapes. Five different positions of 12 different chords. That's what we've covered in this series. And this is the final one. We're doing dominant seven, flat five in this video. This is really important stuff if we want to improvise over chord changes, especially in jazz music, but really just if we want to improvise over chord changes and follow the harmony, know where all the good notes are. I put that in quotes because you can really play any note over any chord, but the, the notes that make up that chord are kind of the skeleton and the home base notes for harmony as it moves along. So we want to know this stuff if we want to improvise or compose melodies uh, over chord progressions. It's also great stuff to practice just straight up for technique, for ear training, so we can hear these structures melodically for just music theory and mapping out the fretboard. And that's why we're doing this whole series. If you want just a PDF resource of everything that's going on with these chord shapes, I have a chord tone vocabulary pack, just all the melodic arpeggio guitar shapes from this whole series, including dominant seven flat five from this video. You can just grab that with the link in the top of the description. Also down there in the description, there is a playlist, a link to a playlist of all the videos in this series. So in this video, I'm just gonna go through and play up and down the five positions, the five melodic arpeggio guitar shapes of dominant seven flat five, just to show you how I think we should all initially work on getting this down. Then I'm gonna go through and just show you the fingerings that I recommend using and that I use for just being able to do that so you can practice that. And then lastly, I'm gonna go through each of those shapes and just improvise a little bit, which is the next thing that I want you to be able to do after you can just play them up and down. This is fun stuff when we're doing these altered dominant chords, dominant seven flat five, really interesting sounding, very stimulating to work on. Let's jump into it. <laughs> Jared Borkowski from soundguitarlessons.com. On this channel, I teach on a wide variety of guitar topics, all designed to help us gain more creative control over music so we can express ourselves more freely. If you're new here, welcome. Please subscribe and hit the bell. All right, so last week I did dominant seven sharp five. This is dominant seven flat five. Same deal really in the sense that it is neglected and avoided in terms of really mapping it out, really targeting it, really nailing it, really knowing it super well and super deeply, seeing all the chord tones for it. The potential for these altered dominant chords, are, it, the reward is so huge, it's worth putting in this work. Let's go ahead and map these chord tone forms out, these arpeggio shapes with the five-step process that I've been doing for this whole series. Check out other videos in this series too if you haven't seen any of the others. I talk differently about various aspects of this along the way, even though I'm going over the same kind of formula each time. We're doing a five-step process for five different shapes uh, on all these different chords. So the five-step process is we just wanna first map it out with root to root method. We start on the lowest root, go up to the next root, repeat that root, don't repeat anything else, don't pause anywhere else. Um, so we really get that sound of the root in our head and know where those are really well. This is the most awkward of all chord tone forms of all arpeggio physical shapes. The reason it's laid out the way it is is because that's where it fits into where it sits in the altered scale. So the scale forms that make the most ergonomic sense to play kind of dictate what chord tone arpeggio shapes we want to play. So we can play around with, know the home base arpeggio notes, the chord tone notes, and then play scale notes around it or chromatic notes around it or anything around it. It also fits in with the whole tone scale. So that's why this is so awkward. We have one and then three, and one and three are always gonna be on the same string if you're playing one with your first finger. And then we have a flat five. So you have to go one, three, that's first finger, pinky, and then reach over with your second finger for the flat five. Then you have flat seven, and then we have one. And here's how I like to do it. Middle finger on one, roll. It's not a bar, but it's kind of rolling. And then pinky, and there's the flat seven there. It's very odd very awkward, very worth getting down, but unlike almost any other kind of arpeggio shape that we ever play, because it certainly doesn't come from one of the normal kind of ergonomic major scales. So um, that's how I do it. You could also slide over, shift over with your first finger. I like that too, it feels pretty cool. 
could even get a slide sound. Okay, but typically I'll do it this way. Okay, so you do that root to root map. I'll do it one more time. After that, we want to do a melodic pattern to break it up. Here's the one I've been doing for this whole series, and just what I recommend we at least have this down. You play the lowest chord tone, you go up to the next chord tone, and then back down. And you do that off each one. Like so. Very awkward. It really puts to the test how well we know it. That's the whole point. We want to map out the every arpeggio shape that way then next we want to just play constant i like to play just kind of constant eighth notes or whoop, didn't mean to play that note that's why we got to do all this drilling work get really confident with it just play continuous notes get all this review of just needing to fly up and down and out of your system try to jump around a bit try to go back and forth and you're improvising but just keeping either constant quarter notes or eighth notes roughly sometimes i'll go you know throw in some other rhythms but i'm not worried about phrasing musically because the next step is that we're going to phrase musically something <laughs> Make it feel like it could be a song. The best improvisations, what we're kind of looking for is if someone says, hey, what song is that? What melody is that? Or you feel like, hey, that could have been, that could have been a melody. That's with phrasing, at least that's what we want to shoot for. It's a great exercise. So that, that step there, that part of the process, we're just wanting to play melodically with phrasing some kind of rhythmic idea that really feels musical and lyrical to us and then the final step is to play and start adding notes around so the thing i really recommend with this is just to try to get used to the altered scale a lot of times and with any of these chords you can add any note around anything and you want to know the chord tones so well that you can just start doing passing tones or play you can just play completely out and then land on chord tones. Chord tones are everywhere, and you can just do whatever you want and then go back to chord tones. And that's super fun. I think that's a great to do by itself. But for this particular chord, I think it's a great opportunity to try to work out the altered scale. I did a two-part lesson series on the altered scale recently, and I'll put a link to that in the description so you can get used to that. Let me play a backing track here. And just a little backing track of different voicings of C dominant seven flat five. So it's C dominant seven flat five, but we're kind of treating it as altered, which means it has flat nine, sharp nine, has flat five and sharp five. And then you want to kind of just go back to pure chord tones whenever you feel like it, just to make sure you are seeing those. So this is a, just a great exercise with any chord type, the scale, that some kind of scale that goes with it, and then just the chord tones and kind of back and forth and make sure you feel musical and good about that. So that's what we want to do with each of the other four arpeggio shapes as well. So we're just going to walk through and do those and that's the process. Okay, here's the next arpeggio shape. <laughs> That's with that root to root approach. Sometimes I'll do it fast, but then slow down just to say, just to show you, yeah, do it, do it nice and slow. Do whatever pace you need to do, whatever works for you. That's step one. Then we want to do our melodic pattern. that one at least one and you can break it up in other kinds of ways too if you want to uh, but this next step kind of does that for us where we're just playing constant notes and kind of hopping around making sure we see the whole thing as a map that we not we're not just seeing one note at a time in an order we're really seeing it all equally A lot of those, those are great little 
mm-hmm. structures to use in actual improvisations. So mm-hmm. then you want to do something that feels musical to you. So a lot of these examples I'm doing through this whole series, I'm just doing something pretty repetitive that maybe ends differently the second time or third time or fourth time that you play it. That's just one approach to phrasing that you can think about. I'm not really thinking about it or or trying to overthink it in this case. I'm just trying to be musical and be rhythmic about it and, and just react to what I played uh, after I start playing. So then after that, we want to, in this case, and, and in a lot of the other lessons, I just say start adding other notes and just kind of taste around, see what you like. Absolutely, you can do that anytime. Do you like that note? Do you like that note? Anything can work depending on how you uh, address it rhythmically. You know, it's a lot of chromaticism. We may or may not want that flavor, but it can work depending on where you place it rhythmically. But again, on this chord, just a great opportunity to try to work on the altered scale. Because I think it sounds quite consonant over this chord. And so melodic. And go back to chord tones. Whenever you feel like it, certainly if you feel like you lost where your chord tones are, go back to them and review them. You gotta just know where they are so any moment you can just land on a home bass note. and just be back into chord tone land. And when you know them that well, then you can get really weird and delay resolutions and get very out and just be confident that, oh yeah, I know exactly where I am, even if I'm choosing not to play the quote unquote good notes. So let's go ahead and go to the next position. All right, there's the next position. Our first finger's playing C, so the third is gonna be on that same string. And then we have to shift over to the flat five here. This is very ergonomically annoying. Here's the flat seven, here's the root, here's the third, flat five. So really that's the worst part is reaching over to the flat three and then back over to the flat five. I'm not, not the flat three, reaching over to the, to the three and then reaching over to the flat five. Okay, one more time. Okay, that's step one. Then we're gonna do our melodic pattern. Okay, so when you work out a fingering for going up and down, strictly up and down, that's not the same fingering you're gonna use for the melodic pattern or some other pattern or for improvising because fingering is all about context, where you're coming from, where you're going to. So work out whatever works for you. Notice I went, I played that with the first finger and then just hopped over. That's fine, start going into survival instinct and just try to work out a fingering that works for you. You can map out a fingering that's very specific too if you're doing a, a certain pattern, um, but don't try to stick to any fingering. If it's for one thing, don't try to then Think of it universally for every time you play that note. That's not how it works. It gets really fun when you're improvising. And honestly, with that with that melodic pattern and really any playing, you could just use one finger even because the point is not kind of flying through it with technique or even the fingering of it. It's about seeing the chord tones. It's about mapping it out. Can we, do we know where the next one is? Right? Do we know where it is so well? That's the whole point. And same with this next step where you're just kind of playing constant notes. Whatever fingers. That's part of the fun of it too. That we're kind of on edge. You're like, oh, can I hang on? I like to speed it up so I'm like hanging on by a thread and like... Can I keep it going? And I like to go slower too and then get more creative with how I'm jumping around with it. 
but I'm definitely thinking of the note first and then the finger is like, okay, what finger can I use depending on where I just was? So then we're gonna try to just do that phrasing thing. Because I got all those notes out of my system in the previous phase, I can really kind of be sparse and, and musical with it. And then that last step is to start playing. You can be musical here too. Musical and trying to add other notes. I just did all of that. It's a little much for, you know, as a musical idea, but just to say it all works. And when you're playing chromatically, very chromatically, I was playing just linear, almost exactly chromatic scale. Of course, it's going to, you know, not sound dissonant necessarily in the sense that a note is not working with the chord because you're passing through notes that are in the chord as well as notes that are out of it. It's about where you stop. And if you know the chord tones that well, just so crazy well, and you stop somewhere on a chord tone, then it sounds like you knew where you were the whole time. Same with if you just get weird. Don't be afraid to try something that might not sound good. You have to be okay with that. Just have fun with it. And this is years and years and years of exploring, finding something that works. If you find, if you know your chord tones well and you find one other note you like, that's a gold mine gonna get familiar and intimate with that sound try to get expressive with it it's just a joy to to slowly let it unfold and, and crack the code on these things all right next position next arpeggio shape this one's very funky root here on the fourth string therefore the third is gonna be with the pinky there here's flat five roll to the flat seven here's the root here's the third of the chord here's the flat five okay and then down here those notes so here's that root to root approach <laughs> messed it up a little bit this this is going to be basically 10th position and then shift over to ninth position uh not ninth 11th position back to 10th and then it's basically it's basically like it's 11th position that whole time where these fingers are lined up 11 12 13 14 and you're, except for the root is on fret 10 there. So that's a nice way to think of it if you're just thinking of positions and, and finger wise. Let's do that melodic pattern. We're not going for speed. We're going for mapping it, seeing it. Again, any fingers that work for you for that. Let's go with the next step, step three. Constant note playing. Chord tones only still. How well do you see it to just keep playing? Do that over a backing track too, though you're getting a good sense of the harmony just by hearing all those chord tones. Then try to do something melodic with it. These altered chords, whoops, these altered chords are hard to do that with, but a great challenge. So something that feels like a real melody, rhythmically, whatever. It doesn't have to be your favorite thing. You just give it a try and try to be uh, lyrical with it. Then we're going to 
start adding all those other notes around things. Here's my loop. Just play with chord tones at first. Okay. Keep playing around with that. And now, again, check out those altered scale videos because you can just think, oh, well, where's my flat two? Where's my sharp, sharp nine, flat nine? And because you know the chord tones so well, you have a great foundation to work around. There's three, so you know, flat three or sharp nine is there. I just try to work on having a good feel with it. So that's just, you know, I'm just kind of practicing in front of you here. That's just, okay, I'm exploring the scale. Okay, final arpeggio shape here. Here's the root, root to root approach. One more time. Funky sound, dominant seven, flat five. That's that first step. Let's do the melodic arpeggio, or melodic pattern, I mean. Again, the reason these shapes exist the way they do is they fit within the whole tone scale and the altered scale. Let's do step three, which is just constant notes. Improvise all around, only chord tones. Kind of however you want to do it. To map your way around this. Good, then you try to do something. Something musical. <laughs> Just playing around with the idea. It's it's usually how you punctuate something that makes it sound like a f an actual musical phrasing statement. Okay, so. Kind of stuck with that theme, very altered sounding, but just playing around with things that are actual reacting to each other, something that uh, one statement reacts to what you played before. That's the fun part about it. And then lastly, let's put on our backing track and just review those chord tones and then just play with adding notes. And I enjoy adding that altered scale in there. That's a bunch of chromatic notes. Here's one, here's three. Here's all those altered notes in there. You could play the whole tone scale. That's all these notes. Anything can work. I love adding those, just passing tones in between any whole step that you have. Kind of sounds like a blues idea a bit. So I'm doing quite a combination of like just chord tones, seeing, just seeing just chord tones, and then kind of knowing the altered scale, and then playing just chromatically. So, and then I'm really accenting a lot. I'll talk more about that on the channel in the future, kind of having a good time and feel and, and more about phrasing and stuff like that. But those are the five steps. And that was the final arpeggio shape for this chord 
chord. Dominant seven, flat five, which is the final chord type in this 12 part series where I went through this whole process with all these chords, kind of a big robust uh, series here that goes really deep and uh, very targeted towards this idea of just wanting to really know what we're doing over any chord type so we can use it in real music and and not be guessing and not be kind of feeling like chords are just passing over our heads as we're trying to play over them and we're just using a major scale or we're using some you know some structure that sounds good on one spot but as soon as other chords come up uh, we're kind of lost so it's a long game it's a long game and we have to enjoy that process of cracking the code and and exploring and trying taking risks uh not sounding great along the way and you know sticking with the things that we enjoy we have to like the process because it really is a long game but uh but it's so worth it if, if improvising over chord changes and chord progressions is your goal then this is one of the things to get just the fundamentals the foundation seeing all those chord tones down um it, it makes a world of a difference all right i just love working on that stuff on especially these more rare odd interesting chords if we can get those down then it really shows us that we know where we are in chord changes as they move along now once you have the vocabulary down like we've done in this series definitely get my chord tone vocabulary pack the melodic arpeggio guitar shapes from this whole series including dominant seven flat five from this lesson free pdf download use the link in the top of the description or go to soundguitarlessons.com slash chord tones hit that like button if you liked this lesson i'm here every week with a new lesson we're done with this series now which was a big thing 12 videos 12 different chord types five positions for each chord type how to play them up and down map them out and then how i recommend just kind of improvising with each one now say you get any of these down or all of these down or even just one chord type down and you want it to help your improvising in actual chord progressions the step from just doing what we've done in this series or this lesson or any of the videos in this series to actually using it as chords move along in real music is a huge challenge to get from where we are here in this lesson to using say if a dominant seven flat five chord comes up for one measure in a progression for two beats in a progression um the vocabulary is there we need to have those shapes down that's why we did this whole series but then there's practice strategies we need to do to really actually be able to switch and follow them it's so hard to do we're not automatically going to be able to switch to these shapes just because we've mapped them out but it is the necessary first step which is why i did this series so coming up in the future we're going to talk more about improvisation we're going to talk about practice strategies techniques exercises to uh nail changes more more accurately by using this vocabulary information uh and that's when it starts to get really exciting playing real music and feeling like we super know what we're doing hearing it more clearly more accuracy better feel better tone better better time all the stuff we want in our playing in our composing in our expressions with music that we're reaching for so anyway i will be back here with another lesson next week and every week and looking forward to more see you there thanks for watching take care and happy practicing mm -hmm.